today we're talking about brotherly love. Why do we bring this up? Matthew chapter 15, verse 3 said, And he answered and said to them, Why do you yourself transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Again, this is not we telling God how to define his word. It's God telling us how to live his word. And that's the difference between the religious and living under the law is when you take God's word and you tell God how you're going to live it. Okay? That's a form of idolatry. Again, you make your little idol, and you say, this is God, and this is what God does. You're defining the terms. When you take God's word and you define the terms, that's called living under the law. But when you do it his way, the way he defines it, now you're living by faith because you're obeying him because he set the terms. I said he set the terms. So we want to make sure we're not living God under a tradition but we're living God under a commandment, meaning what God said we do because he's love. And we want to express that love because we want to obey him. Jesus had the highest expression of love, not through his sacrifice, but through his obedience to be sacrificed. Because if God had never told him to go to the cross, Jesus would not have gone. In fact, Jesus actually had a conversation with him in a garden concerning this very act. Now, if there's any other way to do this, let this cup pass which tells us Jesus did not want to die for you. But I'm going to do what dad says because the highest expression is obedience to dad. And it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross because he was in obedience to his father, even death on the cross. If that's what dad wills, that's what I'll do. Hallelujah. So our whole life should be, as believers, is pleasing our heavenly Father by obeying him at his word, and it's the greatest expression of our love towards him and his love towards us is that he speaks to us and tells us how to walk into life. Amen? Okay. So we saw then it's not just a relationship between us and the Lord, but there's also a relationship among each other. And we've been talking about that there's a way to evangelize the world that the church as a whole sometimes misses or, you know, really by um, on all counts is missing this a lot. We miss a lot by not coming in corporate prayer because it's the greatest weapon we have. And then the next thing is, is that we do not love one another like Christ told us to. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So men don't know that you're a disciple because you tell them about Jesus. Men do not know that you're his disciples just because you can quote Scripture. Men know that you're a disciple because you actually apply what you've learned and you demonstrate it among your family. Yes. And if you'll do that, they'll like, their life's really different because look how they're treating each other. Yes. Amen. And here's the thing. If you really are doing it, then external, um, the external is irrelevant. We do not regard man in the flesh, meaning we do not uh, have a conversation with you about your gender, about your race, any of that, because we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We are all in the blood. Amen. And we value each other's gifts tremendously, and we want to see each other's gifts excel. Amen. Because we were all redeemed out of the hardship of the world that segregated us, separated us, isolated us based upon natural things. But in the church, we don't have this problem because we can uh, deal with our own selves as God said to. And notice he said a new commandment, not a suggestion. Now, when it's all said and done, I just want you to love me. Get along with your brother the best way you can. That's not what it says. No, he says you're going to love them like I loved you. Now, we already know the number one way that he loved us is that he laid down his life for us. In fact, if we went over to John, I'm just going to give you a reference. We're not going to put it up on the board. But again, by two or three witnesses, Jesus said in John 15, starting in 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So abiding in God's love means you do his word, period. Not because you say, I love you, Jesus. All right? Then he goes on and says, verse 11, these things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. You want to have great joy in your life? Just do his will. I mean, it's like awesome. Even when everything around you is falling apart, you'd be like, I'm just a happy person. Because I know I'm doing exactly what dad told me to do in this situation, during this circumstance. And man, I cannot fail. Because my daddy has never failed. And my daddy 
has never lost a battle. He is undefeated. All right? Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. So, Jesus tells us that we are commanded. Again, not a suggestion, we do it. The next verse, he says, no greater loves than this one who laid down his life for his uh, friends, which means you lay down your way of handling the situation. You do it dad's way. It's not, because if it meant the greatest love would be someone who laid down their life for their friend, then we'd all have to die for each other in the concepts physically. Right. But we're not commanded to physically die for each other. Right. But we are to die to self. Yes. We are to die to our flesh. Yes. We are to crucify that flesh, actually, and not live by that flesh, but live by the Spirit, which means we live what the Holy Ghost is telling us from Dad, who's in heaven. Yes. That's how we respond. And sometimes that rubs my feelings wrong, right. but I'm not led by my feelings. Right. Or it rubs my, you know, um, uh, my way I want to respond to an injustice in my own personal life. Right. It rubs me wrong. I've been wrong, really. But how should I respond? Right. What does dad say in yes. this moment? And if I respond dad's way every time, then whether that person receives my response or not, at least I am in the beloved and I'm doing exactly what God and he will deliver me out of all my trouble. Amen. How many like that? Well, the Lord's good. So we see this. Um, so with that being said, let's then define who's your brother. All right. Who is your family? Right. Because it's very important. It's not the person at your home address. Alone. Now, there may be some people at your home address, and yes, we call them natural family. But you understand, let's see how Jesus addressed this, because when we start talking about brotherly love today, you need to know who your brother is. You right? Okay. You know, one of my great movies, you know, of Remember the Titans, you know who your daddy is, right? <laughs> right? You know who your brother is, right? Who's your brother? I said, who's your sister? Well, I'm, we going to know. Because, again, I'm not defining the terms. Jesus defines them. Okay? Jesus defines them. All right. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 to 50, it says this, While he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Now, this is Mary and his half-brothers, James being one of those, right? And they're wanting to meet. This is people he was raised with. Mom gave birth to him. Okay? So they, someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. <laughs> now look what Jesus says in verse 48. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Now many moms right here would be really offended if you heard your child say, Who is my mama? You'd be like, I'll tell you who your mama is. I'm the one who brought you in. I can take you out. Right? That's kind of how that is. That's how that goes. Don't be disrespecting me act like you don't know who your mama is, right? But Jesus says this. Love says, who is my mom, my mother, and my brothers? Now, does that mean he, you know, uh, was having a memory loss? Did he have amnesia? No. Now, he knew who was natural, but he's letting them know. There's a, a family higher. I said higher are just as important. Let's put it that way. Just as important that if you don't put this in the same line as your natural, you're missing it. Okay. He says this, and stretching out his hands towards, towards who? Who? Was it the crowds? Wasn't the crowds. Man, if you weren't with us, you need to find out who the crowds were. Right? You can go on YouTube and find out. Did he reach his hand towards the religious? No. no, but he reached his hands towards who? His disciples, right? He said he reached his hand, reaching his hands towards the disciples. He says, behold, my mother and my brothers. So disciples are part of the family. And he is putting these disciples on the same field as those who live at his home address. Now, there's this nice, cute little thing that goes through the church, right? Uh, especially the fivefold ministers. And then they communicate this to the congregation as if it's holy. Well, now, this is, you know, the order. It's God first, then your family, then the church. Like churches after family. Well, how in the world do you separate family and church? 
That's the problem. Now, I know what their good intentions are, what they're trying to say is, you understand, a pastor can be at the church all the time that he doesn't invest in his personal family because he's dealing with everybody else within the body and causes his family, you know, to resent God. Well, the reality is if they're living right and living balanced, then it won't matter because they're going to love their family like they love everybody else. They're going to care for them. They're going to recognize you're very important. They'll make time for them just as they make time for anyone else within the body. But the reality is, well, you know, I just need to have some family time so I couldn't come to church today. Well, you needed this family time. Because the reality is we don't open these doors every day. So you have a whole lot with your own address. You need to come to this family some. Are you hearing me? So it's really God and in this hits with God. How do you separate God from the church? Because he's the head of the church. So we break it up so that we understand there's elements that we are responsible for, but there's really should be no pecking order in the context that all of a sudden there's God without the church. Because notice God, family, church, like family is in between God and the church. How's that even possible? But when we don't think, when we hear things like this traditionally, we then think, you know, oh, uh, you know, I need to spend more time with my family. You know, pastor, I can't be there. I worked all week. You know, I just need to spend some time with my family. Well, maybe you need to quit your job then. Get a job where you can spend more time with your family. Because how are you going to help your family without God? Okay. Let me go on because I could stay here for the rest of our time and I have a lot. Okay, um, because again, I'm not telling you we're going to look at Scripture, and I'm going to build this case so locked tight, and you don't have to believe anything I say, and I'm going to give you a lot of Scripture today, because we're ending, concluding our series on brotherly love, at brotherly love, okay? So let's go on. Jesus doesn't just point out to disciples and say, this is my mother and this is my brothers and leave it there. He goes on and describes what brothers and mothers look like. Look at this, verse 50. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. So you can't come to me and tell me, you know, I asked Jesus to come to my heart and save me. And tell me that we're brothers and sisters, yet you do not do the will of the Father. Because you're trying to redefine what Jesus said is a brother, sister, and mother. You're, you're trying to tell me that all you had to do was confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and that you're born again and we are going to be, and your responsibility to me and us being connected really isn't important because that had come in heaven anyway. Yet, Jesus defines, now, first of all, they're going to be disciples, which means they're going to be studiers of the Word, they're going to be doers of that Word, and he's saying, listen, they're going to have to do the will. Notice what he didn't say, for whoever hears the will of my Father... A lot of people in church hear them, but not doing. I said, you got to be doing. You have to be doing. So again, very clear definition of who is your brother, sister, and mother. This is why I get really excited around being around people who are doers. Because Jesus is really excited about people who are doers. Amen. Y'all doing all right? Come on, because it gets tougher from here if you're not doing better. I need you to do better. I need you to do way better than this right now. Amen? Way better than this. Amen. I just want to give you clear communication from the Word of what God sees and expects, because the world will define. Listen, there are, are in the world, they'll define brotherhood based upon where they were born, what they look like, uh, how they were raised, what family they're connected. And the Lord's like, this is how you define my family. He defines the family. And he says, behold, my mother and my brothers, these are the ones who do the will of my Father in heaven. They're my brother, sisters, and mother. Right? So do we want to be in his family? Do we want to be acknowledged or seen as the brethren or the brother, brothers and sisters in Christ? You cannot say that you are without doing and operate in all the benefits that come with the family. Amen? 
Now, we all know this in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 30. It says, the king um, will say to those on the right, come and be blessed to my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me sick. You visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous will answer the Lord and say, when were you hungry, and we fed you, and thirsty, and we gave you something to drink? When did we uh, see uh, you as a str- uh, you a stranger, invite you in, naked, and clothe you? Uh, when, did, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to him, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to uh, one of these what? One of these what? Brothers of mine, the New American Standard says, or believers, one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. So notice there's a responsibility for the righteous or the body of Christ to take care of each other. The next statement is what the unrighteous did not do because the unrighteous did not and will not take care of the church. So Jesus' charge to the unrighteous is that you didn't take care of me. Notice, if you read Scripture, the Bible tells you, the Lord's very clear. He says the world loves itself. If you're doing the same thing that the world does, then what difference are you? Right? Right? So what makes us different? We'll actually love our enemy. We'll give them our coat. They'll tell us to go a mile. We'll go two. I mean, there's some things we do different with them that they won't even do for themselves. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But he's saying the world will not take care of my kids. And I'll be able to judge them according to that. But he'll also be able to judge his own family. Because he expects that we take care of ourselves. Notice, you're in the kingdom. He's pulling you in, not because of what you did for the world, but for what you did for a brother of Jesus. And who is his brother? Those who do the will of his father. So when he says, for those, he says, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, and Jesus defined his brotherhood. My brother is him who does the will of the Father. So that means these are born again, blood ball, filled with the Holy Ghost people who are serving God, doing it, and they've run into some challenges along the way. They got into some issues where they had need of some food, and we met it. They happened to have symptoms show up, and we laid hands on them, and we visited them. We took care. Some of them potentially uh, were lost got born again in prison, and then we went and ministered to them. But we're starting to live in a society that if you actually start assembling, uh, the government might throw you in jail. So that could happen even here, and I may be having a prison ministry from the inside. Don't really want my life to end that way, but I'm not uh, ignorant of the fact it could happen. So my point is, you better visit me if I'm in there. (laughs) Right? Because I don't want to be like Paul having to write that letter now. That, that, that guy left me for the world. <laughs> Love the world more. Now, get, 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 you ain't going to control me because you don't show up. But I'm telling you right now, I got a lot of books to write then apparently if I'm stuck up in there. Uh, but I'm believing God we're going to see Jesus come before that happens. <laughs> I mean, I really don't want that to happen. But if Paul's in, I mean, it can. You have to understand there's realities there. That's all. So I'm not delusional when it happens. Well, Pastor Earl, they're going to throw you in jail if you assemble. Well, he said don't forsake the assembly of themselves together. And if I want the power of God, I better stay with him, even if it causes me some discomfort. Paul, man, they tie him up and said, you got a lot of suffering when you go to Jerusalem. And they're like, don't go, Paul. He says, you're breaking my heart because God's already told me I got to go. So I got to go. I got to do the will of my dad. Amen. Amen. How many of us abandon the will of the Father for comfort? I mean, not here. (laughs) Not here. Not you guys. Right? I got to keep saying this. Okay. Amen. So these brothers of mine, that means the church, this is what we do. And this should be without it. Brotherly love is taking care of one another. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Every one of us would agree that that's what we do. And we should do this. With a passion, be deliberate about it. You know, not letting a person's needs go unmet. I am in a hundred percent agreement with you. Let's do this thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
But in order for us to be able to do it at its greatest level, then we all have to actually be operating right. at, in the will of the Father. And if we all are doing the will of the Father, we'll never, we will not stay in conflict with one another. Right. Can't happen. Yeah. It's impossible. It's impossible. Because I'm commanded to love you. Doesn't matter what you do, I'm commanded to love you. Doesn't matter what someone does to you, you're commanded to love them. Right? But now let's define what that looks like. Because listen, God himself, Jesus himself did some writings, and then we'll see how it's demonstrated in the church as well as a case study today, that God knew, I'm fixing to get a whole bunch of people in my kingdom that are babes in Christ, and they're going to bring their thinking into this deal. And I'm going to have to constantly be trying to readjust their thinking because there's ways that the kingdom operates that we cannot. And again, I'm very clear from the beginning, the will, those who do the will of my Father, that's continually now, they're my family, not those who ask Jesus to come into their heart and save them. Right. Now, that's the starting point. Don't get me wrong. But if you're truly born again, then you should be truly seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness. And if we will do that, then these things, when these things come in your life, man, make no mistake about it. We are going to do everything we can to meet that need. A lot of times it can happen internal without us knowing, meaning the church as a whole, like you came to me and said, hey, my brother had some food and I took him some groceries. Maybe I didn't know about it, but you felt led to do so. And God used you to do that. And you met that brother's need. And guess what? God saw that and met it. And that's great. No, problem. We love those types of testimony. We love it when those things, but then there's times that we come together as a church and do. In fact, they were so passionate about this when the church first started that the Bible tells us in uh, the book of Acts uh, 2 and then later over in 4, we see two different examples of where they sold possessions and laid financial things at the feet of the apostles, that was the leaders of the church, to distribute it to the brethren that if anybody had a need, they could be taken care of. In essence, the the body was like, I don't know who may have a problem, but listen, I want to give you this. That way you do it. And I've had people do it, especially during Christmas. They've come and said, now, pastor, we want to help somebody in this. If you know, let us know. We're giving this to you so that you can distribute that. We want to be able to pay for someone's kingdom institute. If you know someone's got to that. Uh, we've got a student that may be going through Washington. We want to pay. Thank you. And we distribute that. Again, the body working together, making sure if there's some need, who it is, what's going on. The reason they brought it to the the apostles, you'll see here in a, a little bit, is that they knew that there was someone discerning. They knew what was going on within the family. They knew how, where people were at and where their lifestyle was and anything they were going through, and they knew who was the most qualified recipient in order to receive. Because we're going to see here that the brethren, to do a brotherly love, sometimes us as brothers, we're not always operating like we should. And I'm going to keep coming back to this because you need to know, no matter what we discuss going further, when a person repents to receive forgiveness, the church is obligated and the family's obligated to forgive them and treat them as if they did not do it. Period. Period. Okay? And here's the thing, if you just do God, then the things we're going to discuss, that doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect you, okay? Know this going forward. It won't affect you. But if you fall in, or if someone falls in, then you must know how brotherly love responds. And, you, and it's not my words, guys. It's what Jesus said. And what the head of his church said, those are those that were um, in the fivefold ministry around his church would communicate. There would be challenges. In fact, I don't have time today to uh, bring this in. I'm just going to mention it to you, and you can study it for yourself. Go to the book of Revelation and read where John was called up, and he's talking to Jesus Christ, the head of the church himself. And he says, go tell the angel of the church at Ephesus, the church at and he kept on. There were seven of them. The angel of the church was the fivefold minister pastor. So he's saying, John, tell the pastor of this church he needs to do this. This is, what I, this is my report concerning the congregation, the oversight of that place. And he called him a church. And he said, now pastors do this. And each one, there was a level of correction that was happening within the body. 
Now, remember, we've already studied how Jesus loved the disciples. We saw that. You'd have to go back to YouTube to see. But we realized there was doctrine issues there. There was um, 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 re um, reproof there, meaning there was bearing evidence of his word coming to pass. But also it would show that if they weren't in line with God's word, there was some conviction of sin that took place. There was actual correction that took place, right? And then there was the training in righteousness, because, again, just because you've been made righteous in Christ Jesus, you are not living righteous until you're trained. Again, I'll give you the example. In 1989, I raised my right hand, and then in 1990, because I was delayed entry uh, in the unit U.S. Army, um, when I went the last time in 1990, uh, January, I was fixing to be shipped off to boot camp. I raised my hand, and I voluntarily became a soldier of the U.S. Army by paper and by my own confession, by all rights, I am owned by the U.S. government as a military soldier, but I have no training as a soldier. And if they had deployed me immediately to some conflict somewhere in the world and handed me uh, a weapon, an M16 at the time was the issue, I would have killed nobody, but probably would have died myself because I did not know that you had to zero this weapon in. I had no concept of that. I wouldn't have known how to break the thing down and uh, overcome it if it's jammed. I would not know that. I would not have known about how to uh, read a compass. I would have known none of these particular things, and I would have put myself and everyone else with me at risk, although by right I am a soldier. Yeah. So when you're born again, you are made the righteousness of God in Christ, but you must be trained in it yeah. so that you release it. Now, after basic training in AIT, Advanced Individual Training, I became equipped to be able to do these things. And still to this day, if I pull out, which I have an AR myself, when I pull that thing out and I've zeroed it in, it's over. <laughs> I went firing with uh, Matt Hunt one day to, you know, shoot some rounds once. I was so bored at 100 yards of hitting tennis balls up the back berm that we moved to a pistol so it would be a little more challenging. Yeah. Period. Yeah. So if I'm on the top of this roof and some conflict's happening and you're on the other side, don't come. <laughs> I'm just talking naturally, you understand. I've been trained. I'm not going to miss I said, I'm not going to miss. Now, I'm not trained like a sniper, <laughs> but I know a guy. <laughs> and I'll put them here <laughs> at my right hand. <laughs> and then another one on my left. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Okay. So, again, we got to be trained in righteousness. So, let's proceed. Because in the body, Jesus knew this is why he commanded us to love one another. He knew he would make us righteous. He knew he would put a new spirit in us that was in his image. He knew he would put love in us. He knew that he would put the third person of the Godhead on the inside of us. But he also knew that we would bring thinking in that would be a conflict to his way of doing life. And he expects the brotherhood meaning the family of God, brothers and sisters, to be able to resolve conflict by all of them going to the source of, con of conflict resolution. That is the Word of God. He expects that his children would no longer take a personal opinion on how to deal with this situation, how they did before their former way of thinking, their old life. They would say, what does Dad say and how should we respond to this? That's why I said, now I'm commanding you to love one another. And love abides in you if you keep my word. Okay? Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 to 24. Y'all all right? He said, therefore, if you are presenting uh, your offering at the altar, and there, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before um, the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother and then come and present your offering. Now, this is a very powerful statement. This is a little bit of an insight that begins to let us know that this idea that we love to say all the time, this is about a personal relationship with God. Yet God says, I can't talk to you personally until you get things right with your brother. 
Now, this isn't popular preaching, <laughs> but that's it nonetheless. Jesus said, we're not even going to be able to have this conversation, all that you're willing to do for me and come to the altar about. We really can't have this conversation till what you know is going on between you and your brother. Right. You at least address it. That's right. You need to address this thing. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? Okay, he says, leave the offering before the first be reconciled. So the goal is, the reason I'm going to go talk to you is because I realize you got this problem with me, and I want to try to reconcile this deal. Now, let's just see what it doesn't say. Does it say that if the brother refuses to reconcile, you're just in trouble now? Because a brother that refuses to get right with you you'll never be able to talk to God again. How many of you believe that? No. So what he's saying is first go be reconciled. In essence, go try to restore the relationship. Get it off the shelf because if they'll do the word and you do the word, then there should be no conflict. But now if you go to them, and we'll see because I'm going to show you some examples about going and not everybody responds properly. But yet at least you're free. Because you've done what God would have done, and that is, I can't let us come to church and know there's a conflict. So this is why sometimes your worship can seem shallow. It seems like your prayers aren't going as far as they could. It's because you know when you come to church, that person's there, and you're like, mm, yeah, they're not really well with me. But you've not even talked to them about it. Not even had a conversation. And you're like, well, you know, God would deal with that. God does deal with it. He says, go talk to them. Well, now, I don't, I don't want to talk to them about this because we want to avoid conflict. Love never avoids conflict. Good. Yeah. Good. Right. Love never avoids conflict. That is so good. The greatest conflict that ever hit humanity was when Adam ate the fruit. And the Lord didn't go, well, I'm not going to go down there and talk to him about this anymore. No, love came down and says, what's the problem? What'd you do? Now look what I got to do. Because of what you did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with this conflict. <laughs> That's brotherly love. Brotherly love is not avoiding it. Amen. Now again, what's, why are we going to them? Hey, I just want you to know the way you're feeling about me is wrong, and you need to get it right. Now I'm going to go back and worship God. <laughs> That's not what that looks like. <laughs> it's like, hey, um, can we talk? I hear there's, you know, a problem. And, man, I love you. I, I don't want this between us. I mean, what, you know, did I do something? You know, did it look like I did something? I mean, honestly, you know, I ask you to forgive me. I repent. You hear what I'm saying? But, you know, too often we allow pride to show up in our walk with God. We're born again, but our mind still got pride. And we don't want to go talk to our brother. Because, again, it's a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not. Because if you personally love Jesus, you'd personally love each other. All right, let's go on. Well, let's look. Let's continue the progression, right? And Matthew, what I'm showing is, is that you have a responsibility to reconcile. And what it always starts with us. Let me tell you, everything about brotherly love first starts with us. That's why I'm going to build this case real quick. It starts with us, but it doesn't mean we don't have to deal with each other. Well, I, I'm just going to go to church. I don't want to deal with nobody. I don't want to talk to nobody. That's not brotherly love. It's not brotherly love, okay? Um, you're going to run into problems. I mean, we see this in the natural. Yeah. Right. We run in with problems, right? I remember one time, me and my sister, she had a, a, a spider on the wall at the house, and so they called me in to defend their honor. <laughs> so, you know, I'm up on the chair. I don't know what it is about bare feet with me, but it seems naked, right? And I was barefooted at the time for some reason, right? And um, I'm up there. I mean, it's one of them wolf spiders, you know? It's real big. Right, looks gigantic, you know. And when you're a little kid, it's like this. It's, a, it's like alien. It hit my face, you know. It's going to suck my brain out. Okay, so I'm up there, and my sister and my mom are in the doorway watching. Everybody's quiet. 
<laughs> and I take that shoe and I hit it and I kill it. Well, the minute it hits, my sister goes, ah! like that. Scared me to death. <laughs> scared me. I mean, I was like, ah! I was so and that when she scared me like that, because I was super intense, thinking I'm laying my life on the line right now. This thing's gonna jump off and eat my face off for you. <laughs> I'm loving you. <laughs> and she scared me so bad, man, it made me so I turned around, took that shoe, and threw it at her. <laughs> and hit her. And she cried. <laughs> and my mom was not well with that. Because <laughs> that wasn't love. So I had to ask her to forgive me. Amen. I might have got grounded. Maybe not. I don't know. But that mark of that spider stayed up on that wall for years. And my dad's a painter. Just to let you know. We didn't paint that wall forever. I think it was just remember the day I threw that shoe at you. No, I'm sorry. I'm saying you're going to have conflict. And all of a sudden, we have this fairy tale thinking that when we come into church, that all that matters is our relationship with God and that you and I don't matter towards one another. Yet the Bible's totally contrary to that. Totally contrary to that. And he's gonna, he lets us know we're going to have some conflict, but we can handle it every time by going to the Word. And when, if you're going to handle the conflict, start with you. So he's like, you know, there's a conflict with your brother. You're aware of it, so you go to him. Don't wait for him to come to you. Get it fixed. Just go ahead and humble yourself and go get it fixed. Okay? All right. The next thing we see here in Matthew 7, 3 through 5, it says this. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but not, at the, uh, but not notice the law that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, a log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, notice what it does not say. It does not say that a person with a log in their eye can never see a speck in someone else's. I mean, you can have all kind of junk going wrong with you and see problems in other people's lives and be right. The problem is what we typically do is we take an attitude. Well, you know, well, look at them. They're not doing it. Well, look at them. And we're justifying our logs. I mean, we want a bonfire, apparently. Right? We justify on our logs. Well, look at that. Look at that. And then, you know, we see sometimes specs, and we go to them and start talking to them about theirs so we don't feel so bad about us. And the Lord has no actual problem with us actually going to the person. In fact, God wants us to because he concludes this by saying, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye, which means there can be a, an irritant, something that's causing them to not see as clear as they could, and until you have clarity, you really shouldn't help them with their clarity. But if you'll get clear first, then I can use you to help get them clear. Oh, I'm preaching. <laughs> right? So again, it's not about, hey, man, you blowing it. I see what you're doing, right? No, it's, okay, before I go there, where am I? How am I? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because if you don't deal with logs in your eyes, these are, can become these stumbling blocks in you that you are perceiving how you should address a matter when you don't even have clarity how to address it. You know, I saw so-and-so ain't with so-and-so anymore. You know, my, my spouse left me. I know how they feel. You know what? I'm going to go over there and talk to them. And then all of a sudden, you give them all the advice of how you wish you would have responded to your ex. And it's not even the same situation. So you cloud this hurt they have to be able to give them deliverance. In essence, you've coddled their flesh and moved them in a direction that God may have never wanted them to go because you didn't deal with the fact that I forgave the issues that took place in my own marriage. But what do we do? We tend to run to people that's had all these issues and try to get advice from them instead of running to the Lord first. The Lord's like, deal, let me deal with you. Let me get you taken care of. And then I can use you, which tells us God's okay when brothers go to brothers because that's love. And say, well, let me help you out. I want to show this to you. That's love. But again, you know as well as I do. Because we brought in a world mentality into the kingdom of God. If we don't watch out, we'll bring Cain in when Abel shows up. 
And all of a sudden, you want to kill your brother because he's just trying to get you to run with God at a higher level, at your potential. Instead of you hearing them say, you're awesome, you're great, you're this, you hear, you suck, you're no good, you're never going to make it. And the only reason you hear that is because you have a personal condemnation anyway because of what you're in. That they're trying to get that off the table for you. But yet you want to have a personal relationship with God and who are you to talk to me? Well, I mean, Dad sent me. <laughs> I mean, honestly, Jesus said that I needed to show up. Because you weren't listening to him when he was talking to you by the Holy Ghost anyway. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right, now look at Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. says this, be on your guard if, that's a conditional statement. If you don't do this if, then this is not going to happen. Do you see that? This is what's empowering. Our brotherly love is that we're not going to do what this brother did. And if we don't do what this brother did, then, we're not, then the situation doesn't happen to happen like this. But if the brother does do this, then this is how Jesus said, handle the situation. Be on your guard. What's that mean? Deal with your log. <laughs> Make sure you're walking in love and you have this desire to go and reconcile. You want to see them right, standing with your heavenly Father, our Father together, so that we can all advance his cause together. Be on your guard if, conditional statement, your brother what? Sin. So believers can sin. Those in covenant can sin. Now, it's not a sin that separates you from the Father so that if you sin, bam, you drop dead at that particular moment. All of a sudden, you would be cast into the lake of fire. That's not the case. But you can disobey your Father, although you're in a covenant with him. He says, if your brother sins, what do you do? You don't say, hey, man, I know you're doing this wrong, but it's okay. Don't worry about it. God loves you. Okay, okay. Doesn't say that. It says rebuke them. You know, don't talk to me like that. Only God can talk. God sent me to talk to you because he loves you and I love you. And what you're doing is contrary to what dad says. And I'm telling you, you're going to need to change. Now it says if he sins or let's go on. If he what? Repents. What do you do? Now what's implied here if he doesn't repent? What's implied here? If he doesn't repent, then what can you not do? Now, that's like heresy in today's thought process of the love of God. But you know what? It really is the love of God, period. Because we have this thought that because Jesus shed his blood and, and, and made provision for the forgiveness of sin, we tell everybody God's already forgiven your sin. That is not true. It's not a true statement. And I'm going to read this scripture to you. In, in Acts chapter um, 20, uh, 26, verse 18, Paul's ministry, he's telling King Agrippa what he was to do, and God told him this. This is in red letter in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. So Jesus said this. He said, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive, not that they have it, but they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So again, just because Jesus has poured out his blood on the mercy seat once and for all to deal with all sin, you do not actually get forgiveness until you repent. And here we are in brotherly love. Our brother, if he's caught in sin, we go and say, hey, man, you need to, yeah, it's no big deal. It's all right, man. God loves me. It's okay. You know, you just need to forgive me. I can't because you've not actually repented. And God doesn't forgive you if you don't repent. So how am I supposed to act like it's not a big deal when it's huge to our dad who sent his son and has got blood pouring all over the mercy seat in heaven just for this occasion that you could come down according to 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins, and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yeah, you want me to hug you in your sin because I love you.
That's not what love tells me to do. Love says brotherly love if, if, if. And here's the thing. God's really empowered us so much to not that this should not be the norm. This should be abnormal. But again, we will have conflict because the renewing of our minds, we're going to be doing some things that we used to do in our carnality. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 said, look, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual, but as babes in Christ because you're acting carnal. He was rebuking a church because they were living a behavior that they had a power to not live that way. And he was demonstrating love to them. Not, well, I'm, man, I get it, guys. I mean, I understand. But this is how we are being trained or taught by the world and by other churches that only um, does not accept the true definition of love, but accept this definition that love is acceptance. God accepts you just like he is. That is a lie. That is a doctrine of demons. He will not accept you as you are. He sees you as you are and says it's unacceptable. So I sent my son to stand in the gap. Now, if you'll accept him... I'll change you. Amen. When you're born again, you're changed. You're not accepted. The only thing that comes from the old world into this new life is you're in a skin suit that can't stay, can't live forever, and you got a mind that's got to be renewed, but you can actually get trained now, and you're going to want to if you'll listen to your spirit and hear the Holy Ghost. Powerful things we're in. But again, because we do not look at it this way, we're like, God loves you. It doesn't matter what you're doing. God loves you. God's not accepting what you're doing. God is saying, repent, change, change your thinking, and change your behavior. If you change your thinking, you'll change your behavior, and you'll change your lifestyle. You'll change your outcome. In fact, he says that we, if our brothers in sin, go back to that verse. He said, if your brothers in sin, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Then he says this, if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, again, saying, I repent. Saying what? I repent. Forgive them. So again, brotherly love wants to forgive. So much so. But we need your condition of repentance. We need it. So again, a lot of times, well, I don't understand why, you know, uh, so-and-so hadn't been around. I mean, the church should love them. Well, has the church loved them? And are they just not repenting? Well, they just ought to forgive them. I cannot love you different than God tells me to love you. But know this, forgiveness is like right there. It's like wanting to jump on you. Just like the blood of Jesus is right there. Because if the blood of Jesus is already getting on everybody for the forgiveness of their sins, then this is the doctrine of inclusion. You don't even have to have a confession of faith or repent at all. We're all done. We're saved. I mean, why are we even having church today? The whole world, even the most ungodly, are okay. But we do know the blood's already taken care of all those people. So why aren't they walking in it? Because they have not repented. But again, we get in the body of Christ, all of a sudden we act like we don't have to repent anymore. Because we've been taught repentance is a one-time event. It's not. It's a changing of thinking, which means, hey, now that's really not dad's best here. And you're going to need to change that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay, let's go on. Um, hmm. So, how important does God see that we have the answer and that we are the source of all answers in the body. Now, let's take a, a church case. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 1, says this. He says, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, and we'll see that neighbor is a brother in Christ. And now again, he's writing to the church. He's not saying a uh, neighbor that's ungodly. He's talking about themselves. Dare to go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints, meaning... If you get a problem with one another, you'll go out into the world and ask them to settle your case. He says this, or do you not know that saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not um, competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that you, we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? What's he saying? You have an authority that exceeds any other court system man can put together. And not only do you have it, you have this authority, 
But the fact that you would be willing to subject yourself to a ruling from someone who's ungodly, right. this is a problem. He says, I say this to your, no, sorry, verse um, 4. So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? Meaning, these people aren't even accountable to the church. They don't even seek the authority of God for their decision making. And you'll run to them and allow them to give you a final ruling on how to address this. Now, look what he says in the next verse. Because would, would a brotherly love say this? Paul writing this letter to the church under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, which means when he made this statement, the Holy Ghost could have said, no, don't say that. He says this, verse 5, I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. I'm amazed at how people in the church will go to their co-workers to seek advice that aren't even in the church and aren't even living for God, and you'll get, take their advice over the church. Brotherly love doesn't do that. Brotherly love says, listen, let's go to God, let's get in the Word, and let's settle this thing. And again, if we can't seem to re uh, resolve it because we have too much emotion involved, what do you do? You go to someone who has no emotion in your matter, right. meaning they are not connected. This is why before uh, we do any meetings with married couples, uh, uh, um, or when we do, I'm always a little long-armed when I talk to one spouse because they're going to want to try to put an uh, image of how the situation is that can create a log in my life when I meet with the other spouse. So I'm easy if I meet with them by themselves and say, now listen, if everything you say is correct, let's see what the Word says you should do. Because again, I put them back to personal responsibility. Most of the time, they're like, you get them right. Well, we're not going to deal with their spec today. <laughs> but with that, I know they have a side and maybe... Maybe their side is equally as true or more true than this one. In both cases, when they come together, I'm not personally involved. I'm not emotionally attached. I've not personally been hurt. So I don't have to filter through those emotions. And I can say, but the Word says. Now, at that juncture, those individuals are going to have to let crucify their flesh and say, you know what? I'm just going to do it God's way. Yes. But did they hurt you? Yep. Were you wronged? You bet. But God. Amen. I said, but God. Look what he goes on to say here. He says this. He said, actually then, it is already defeat for you, meaning the minute you go, you're already defeated. Yeah. He said that you have lawsuits with one another. He said, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? Meaning, if there is a brother that is doing something outside the behavior and character of God. Try to resolve it with them inside with the Word. If they refuse to do it and will not do it, then in this case, instead of really trying to take them to court to say, you know, I'm going to prove that I'm right, you could say, you know what, Lord? I give it away. I sow it to them. I just let it go. Because you know that I've done everything I can to reconcile that situation. And you know what? You open up that God can get back to you exceedingly abundantly more than they defrauded you from. Or whatever they actually wronged you with, you've released them. Because you're in this posture, I'll forgive them at a moment's notice. I'll forgive them at a moment's notice. I'm just going to let it go. I'll forgive them at a moment, moment's notice. And because of that, you release this kind of burden that they, you know, well, you know, they, they, every time they look at me, it's this. And I, I know that they got this issue with me. You're like, I don't have an issue with you. We're just going to let this go. Now, if they don't deal, they may come back and open up the door. Well, they come back and say, you know what? I did wrong you. Will you forgive me? I repent. I repent. Uh, this is brotherly love. Paul wrote this to a church. This is how brothers work. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 
Jesus had another issue uh, or another case study in a church, the Galatian church, not just one, I'm giving you another one, where there was a conflict. And as a result of that, there was confrontation to resolve it. Now look at this one. He's actually going to correct the church for how they're living their life with God in Galatians chapter 3. Okay? He doesn't go, man, I love you guys so much. You're so awesome. I know you're not doing everything right, but God loves you. I just want you to know that. He doesn't say that. He says, why are you being foolish? Right? But then he uses a personal story in the previous chapter to set up, I, I'll correct you and let you know you're doing wrong because anyone that's a brother not doing right, we have to go to him and talk to him. My lo the love of God compels me to do that. So we see here in Galatians 2, starting in verse 11, it says, But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face but he st because he stood condemned. Notice he went to the man's face. Didn't write him an email. Didn't get on Facebook. Didn't send him a private message. Although we'll talk about some private here in a minute. In this particular case, it calls Paul to have to openly confront this. And this was love doing it. He said, for prior to coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw uh, and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. So he has this relationship with the uh, Gentiles. But when Jews get around, he act like, oh, I can't really be around them. Okay? Which was part of the law about se being separated, some different things. But we're now in Christ. We, we're under this new and better covenant. So he ends up saying the rest of the Jews joined in the hypocrisy with the results of even Barnabas being carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, again, this is a doctrine issue. And he said, love one another as I loved you. So address the doctrine of which Paul went to Peter at a different time who he called a pillar of the church and said, I've been preaching this that I got from Jesus that he personally trained me. Am I right? I don't want to be preaching in vain. And Peter was like, you got it right. I was with him. I walked with him. I saw those miracles. Exactly what you're saying. That is the voice of our Lord Jesus. So they were in agreement that day. Right. But in this day, there's not an agreement because of his behavior acting in hypocrisy. So he says, I said to Cephas, or Peter, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like the Jews, what? How is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So basically, he goes on and presents his case that you're not doing right. You know what? I'm thankful that Peter repented. Yeah. Peter didn't say, man, you're just hard to work with. I know about you. You and Barnabas got in such a fight one time over John Mark. You're hard to work with. No. Barnabas didn't think that about him. It just they split ways. That's true. But he cultivated John Mark and said, now listen, Paul, he's serious about what he's doing. If you ever want to do work with him, you're going to have to be disciplined. You're going to have to do this. And later on, Paul said in Tim, one of Timothy's letters, he said, send me John Mark for he's become profitable for ministry now. And he couldn't be profitable to help Paul if Barnabas was saying, I really hate that Paul. I just don't like the way he does ministry. I just don't like the way he does it. That's not how I would do it. That obviously didn't translate because he was commanded to love. Well, me and Paul, we didn't finish. you know. And honestly, I think Barnabas had to come to the conclusion it was his fault. Because God says, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them. Never was an argument between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark supposed to separate that. But we hear Paul's name still, but we lose Barnabas' name. Are you hearing me? So we may not agree. In fact, our conversation concerning some things could get heated. But that doesn't mean we're not commanded to love one another. So he goes on to the church at the third chapter, and he begins to tell them, listen, you started this thing in the spirit, how are you working out in the flesh? And he was rebuking them, saying, you're living this wrong because he loved them. When someone comes to you about a situation going on in your life, it does not mean that they hate you or they're trying to come after you. It's that they want to see your full potential, and this is how we should live. We should be living like this among each other. When you see somebody, man, what's going on? What's happening in your life today? I see you're a little frustrated. I saw how you talk right there. You all right? 
At minimum, we're like, man, let me pray for them. Some things are going on. I just want to make power available because I want them to make right choices. Because I know the love of God in them. I know the power of God in them. But if they don't, can, if they don't change, then, you know, I'm, you know, God may use me to address it. Because I love them too much to see them like that. Are you hearing me? So, what if, though, these confrontations where we see very clearly if there is something done not the way God wanted, because, again, if your brother's in sin, if he does sin, which is not the way God would do it, and you go and show them how God tells them to do it, and they repent, and we forgive, and we act like this never happened. I mean, we act like it's never happened. If you come to church and you look at people and you remember how they treated you, and it's still a, that's, you have a problem. You're going to need to fix that. Because that's not well in the body. You can't be upset with one of God's kids and God be like, I'm fine with it. Right. That's true. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Now, some of you, I give time when I know you got challenges. Just like you give ch time for some people too. But there'll come a point where all of us are going to have some conversation. Now, we have no problem doing this in our own natural home. Right? Your kids acting up towards one another. You're like, what are you doing? Why'd you talk to her like that? Now you go over there and ask them to forgive you. Don't we do this? Now go ahead and hug them. I mean, we're like forcing it to happen, right? You give them a hug. <laughs> now we're good, right? But you don't, their little hearts are like, ah, I'm taking all your stuffed toys. I'm going to burn them all, burn them all. <laughs> I mean, but we want them to what? Be wrecked. Who wants to live in a house full of conflict where your kids are like biting each other's back all the time and mad? Nobody wants to live in that. Nobody's sane and living in the love of God. Right? Those delusional and deceived maybe, but not the godly. We know there's a behavior different. Yet we'll come to church and have ought. can't happen. Brotherly love requires us to go further. Because God's just not overlooking it. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, seriously, how would you like if your sibling always got away with everything? Get away with everything. You know, we have a definition of God's love that implies that. And it's just not true. Because everything that goes against his word, he has to deal with. Oh, it's quiet. Okay, now again, we're just going to progression. Because again, the highest thing is that all of us obey God. And we can... Because the love of God is in us. And we can all submit to God's word. We can let go of our flesh, our emotions about that matter. No matter what it felt like, we can let it go. And we can say, I'm going to do it God's way. Okay? But we're having to follow a trail. What if someone doesn't? How does brotherly love respond? And again, don't be the brother that this is the problem with. Okay? All right. So don't get all jacked up real quick <laughs> as we go further. All right. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 17 says, If your brother sins again, conditional. If he doesn't sin, we don't have to do this. This action is not required if this doesn't take place. But if your brother sins, go and show him his fault. How? In private. So again, the rule of thumb, the majority of the time, unlike what Peter had, uh, Paul had to do with Peter, that was not the norm, although that sometimes will happen. But in this case, the majority of the time, if your brother's in sin, what do you do? You go to him in private, which means you don't get on Facebook and start telling them about their life and act like you gave them something private. This is why the world laughs at the church. They see us as like a bunch of sharks feeding on each other. Now, you may be right, but if you ain't operating in the right spirit, that's the problem. Again, it's about reconciliation. Man, I don't want nobody to know you blew it. And the world does a great job of covering up. But as much as they cover up, sin always manifests. If it's not 
dealt with by blood of Jesus, it's going to show up. Okay? So let us deal with it. And he says, go to him private. If he condition. Now notice, I'm going to go because they sinned. If they listen, what did we do? We won the brother. He's going to repent. I'm going to forgive. And we're going to act like it didn't happen. And we're going to rejoice and be excited because we see the power of God again in this situation take care of that problem. But these are conditions. So I'm not even going if he, doesn't, if he doesn't sin. But if he has sinned, I'm going. Now, now that I've gone, it's back on him that I've let him know what his sin was. They have to listen. They have to listen. If they listen, we get it. If they don't listen, look what happens. Verse 16, so there's a progression. But if he does not listen to you, now what do you do? We're having another meeting. We're having another meeting. And we take two or three more with us so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact is confirmed. So this tells us if there's a problem that we have with our brother, we want him to repent so that forgiveness can be there. But if he doesn't and he continues to do the same behavior and others are seeing it as well, we'll take a smaller group and let's have some brotherly love. And say, now listen, this ain't my opinion about it, man. I mean, listen, this is what the scripture says. And they're like, yeah, that's what the scripture says, man. We need to make this change. But verse 17, if he refuses, notice if the brother just wouldn't refuse, we wouldn't be in this problem. Okay? If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now, the church can be in two different forms. One, it can be the leadership of the church. Because, again, everything's about trying to keep everybody from knowing. But some can be in layers of leadership like Peter. And Paul's going to let everybody know. That lifestyle and action is not in keeping with how our Heavenly Father lives. So don't think you can continue to do this and it's okay. Now, Peter, you know that's right. And Peter was humble enough to say, yep, you got it. That's right. Thank God for Peter. That he didn't get offended. Amen. Why do we get so offended so quickly when we've been forgiven of so many things? So he goes on and says, you can tell it to the church. Now, you may have to bring it to the church. And in the years that I've, 16 years in this location, I've only brought about three instances from the platform. He said, again, if he refuses to listen to even the church. Now, here's three times that this person could have actually not been on this course. But now look what brotherly love will do if they won't even repent in front of the church. It says, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, meaning you're going to separate fellowship. Because love will put you out of the garden. But we've accepted love. We're just, we just going to endure. We're just going to put up with it. I mean, God's going to endure. Man, we just let it go. And they just keep living any old way, and we just let it go. And everybody knows, and we're letting it go. And we're like, this is love. And love's like, I don't let it go. Oh, it's quiet. I know. I know. Because this, this conversation here makes us see our responsibility to one another. That, again, you have all the power within you because you have the Holy Ghost Man, to live a thriving life in righteousness. And it's a joy to be around the brethren. Oh, it's so awesome. We can do so many things together, right? So he goes on and begins to, down in verse 21, same chapter, he begins to give a little bit of an illustration here. He says, Then Peter came to him and said, Now, Lord, how often shall, I, um, shall my brother sin against me that I forgive him? Because Peter's got a little conflict here. He realizes, so like what, every dang time? I mean, Right? And the Lord's like, uh, so he you know, throws a number up to seven times. And the Lord says to him, no, I don't say up to seven times. I say 70 times seven. Meaning, you always stay in a position that if your brother repents, forgive him. I don't care how many times you've seen him wrong. If he really has a heart of repentance, just forgive him, man. Just forgive him. Right? Stay led by the Spirit. So then he ends up giving this illustration. He said, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, he uh, one owed him 10,000 talents. Uh, and I just had someone tell me that's $64 billion in gold. 
But since he did not have the means to repay it, his uh, Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children, all that he had, and repayment be made. So uh, the slave fell to the ground, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, I will repay everything. And the Lord uh, of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him of the debt. So again, the only way that this guy's off is because forgiveness showed up, and forgiveness showed up based upon him asking. Okay? Compassion showed up. It says, But the slave went out and found uh, one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarian. <laughs> Very small amount. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. And his fellow slave fell to the ground. Do we not know what this is? And began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, I'll repay you. Right? He who's never sinned, what? Cast the first stone. But he was unwilling and went through him in prison till he should pay what was owed. So when the fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. And summoning him, the Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you of all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handing him over to the torturers until he repaid all that he was owed. Wow, that's a terrible turn of events. Verse 35, my heavenly father, Jesus is making the connection now, my heavenly father will also do the same to you. If you, if each of you does not forgive his brother, how? From the heart. Meaning, if you come to dad and ask him to forgive you, and then there's an issue with your brother, and you won't forgive them, dad is going to put you out. So not only will dad put out someone who refuses to sin, dad will put out someone who refuses to forgive. Now, since we're talking about being put out, Matthew, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13, the Passion Translation says it this way. It's been widely reported that there is a gross sexual immorality among you, a kind of immorality that is so revolting uh, it's not even tolerated by social norms of unbelievers. Uh, are you proud of the fact that one of your men is having sex with his stepmother? Shouldn't this be heartbreaking scandal? Shouldn't this heartbreaking scandal bring you to your knees in tears? You must remove the offender from among you. Why is it that we know people are living in sin continually and we're like embracing them like it's no big deal? Now, it's different if you're lost and you come in here and you're in sin. Well, you're going to do that. But if you're born again and you're caught in a trespass and we know about it, I'm going to give God time to talk to you. But there's going to come a time that God's going to make me move. Because brotherly love compels me to do so. Paul says, we got a problem. Do you? I mean, Paul's like, you, you're like saying, hey, God loves you no matter what. No big deal. No, it's, man, don't be quiet. Please help me out. He says this. He says, even though I'm physically far away from you, my spirit is present with you. Uh, and as one who is present with you, I've already evaluated and judged the perpetrator. So call a meeting, and when you gather together a number of, uh, or in the name of our Lord Jesus, and you know my spirit is present with you in the infinite power of the Lord Jesus, release this man over to Satan for the destruction of his rebellious flesh and hope that his spirit may be rescued and restored in the day of the Lord. Notice he's saying if we do not address this sin that a believer's doing, they're at risk of something far greater. And for their own Safety and eternal security. Right. It's time to put them out. And brotherly love does that. Yeah. He says, um, verse, what verse was I on? Verse 6 now. Boasting over your tolerance of sin is inappropriate. Man, we'll love you just the way you are. Doesn't matter how you are. Just come on. Well, I mean, I'm going to love a sinner. You're lost. I know you need Jesus. We're going to deal with some things. But if you start coming and perpetuating your sin act like it's a, oh, acceptable to God, we're going to have some conflict. And if you're a believer and you're going to start operating in sin and perpetuating it towards the body as if it's okay, we're going to have a conflict. When I was in youth ministry, I had a guy show up dressed like a girl in youth ministry. Years ago, years ago, over 16 years ago. Pastor's like, uh, what are we going to do about that? You know, I said, well, pastor... 
You, you and I both have a heart that they would get born again. We know they just need Jesus. I said, so I say, you know, let's give them out three or four times to hear the word and respond to it. But if they don't, then we'll have a conversation. Well, I didn't even have to have a conversation because the word was so revealing. And I didn't talk about them, their subject matter, what they were going through. I would have had a whole different preaching ser sermon. But the love and the anointing of God caused this person not to be able to stay in that house without change. But they'll never stand before God if they've continued this road and be able to stand before Jesus and say, I didn't know. I didn't know that you had a different destiny and purpose for me, and I was just trying to discover something that I was unaware of that I was trying to discover. I was deceived into a thought process that wasn't even reality. I thought it was true, but it wasn't because he was confronted with truth. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. So we can tolerate that for a little bit, but even after a while. Now, if they would have been and started talking to all my other guys and telling them they should dress like him, we'd have had a conflict. And that if it was acceptable to God and God loves them just like that, that's, we wouldn't tolerate that. We'd have to step in and say, but that's not what my king says. It's nothing personal. So he goes on and says this, don't you understand that even a small compromise? Ah, Hallelujah. Um, would sin permeates the entire fellowship with a uh, little leaven permeates a batch of dough. So remove every trace of leaven or compromise so that sin may, uh, might become new and pure again. For indeed, you are clean because of Christ or Passover. It goes on. Let's jump down to verse um, 9. He said, I wrote to you in my previous letter asking you not to associate with those who practice in, uh, sexual immorality. Yet in no way was I referring to avoid contact with unbelievers who are immoral, greedy, swindlers, and those who worship other gods. Um, for that would mean you'd have to isolate yourself from the world entirely. So obviously we are the light to the world. He said, but now I'm writing to you so that you would exclude from your fellowship anyone who calls himself a fellow believer and practices sexual immorality and is consumed with greed or is an idolater or is verbally abusive or is a drunkard or a swindler. Don't mingle with them or even have a meal with someone like that. He said, what right do I have to pronounce judgment on unbelievers? That's God's responsibility. But those who are inside the church, family, are our responsibility to discern and judge. So it's your duty to remove that wicked one from among you. See, here's the problem. I know people that externally get around you and tell you about how much they love God, how much they care about God, how they do things for God. But I know how they talk to their spouse. I know how they treated their kids. I know what constant sin they're in and it's put us in a position that i got to get rid of them. But then they'll call you and want to do lunch with you. And then tell you their side. And then they'll say, we ain't walking in love. When love required me to put them out. You can't stay here. There was a brother that cheated on his wife years ago. Put them out. Came to him private, went to him with uh, two or three witnesses, brought it before. I said, you know where I'm going next. They left. Gone four months. Then a brother in the church, led by the Spirit, no sooner, no later, went to them over at their job and said, when are you going to repent? They did repent. Came back. We restored them and their spouse. And to my knowledge, they're still married today. They've moved to another state. It was always about reconciliation, but had to put them out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because love commands it, demands it, requires it. Love doesn't just let us do anything we want to do, wherever we want to do, because we're in the body of Christ. Love says, you got a higher deal than this. And he says, I'm holding you responsible with one another. Now, this is why people don't want to come and assemble all the time. Oh, no. Nah. Because we don't want to, us to know what's really going on. But again, we want you to overcome what's really going on. Because again, if you deal with it in private yourself anyway with the Holy Ghost, we're not even having this conversation. But he said, don't even mingle with them. Don't even have a meal. You know, I used to be with them all the time. Now they won't do nothing. They're a cult. All they want to do, nobody will hang out with me. I mean, the only reason we ain't hanging out, because we are sitting on ready for you to repent. Because everybody knew what I knew. 
You know this about people yourself. If they knew what I knew that you're doing and you're not wanting to repent, they wouldn't be hanging out with you either if they really were walking in brotherly love. It wasn't personal. It wasn't that we hated you. It wasn't that we didn't care about you. It's that I'm constrained by the law of love. That says, this is how I must respond. He goes on in 2 Corinthians, last scripture is this. Come on up, worship team. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 7, concerning just laziness with the brethren. He says this, now I command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus, you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which we receive from you. Again, Paul was telling the church, now there's some people that ain't responding right, and I'm asking you to get yourself cut off from them. And you're like, wow, why would we do? I thought we were supposed to love them. We are giving them every opportunity opportunity to love us by doing the word but because they're not doing the word brotherly love must continue to move in a direction that we're going to have to become excluded from one another and it's not me that's doing it but i will get blamed and so will you just to let you know okay just to let you know you'll get blamed But when you know that you're sitting on ready and that if they repent, you're like, man, wow, and you embrace them and hug them and care for them. (laughs) Because you know that's what you would do. He says, for you yourselves know how um, how you ought to follow our example. Because we acted, we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but we labored in hardship. Um, We kept working night and day so that uh, we would not be a burden to any of you, not because that we didn't have a right, but but in order to offer uh, ourselves as a model so that you would follow our example. For even when uh, we were there, you used to give this, uh, uh, we used to give this order. If anyone is not willing to work, he's, uh, he, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, acting like busybodies. Now such persons we commit and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with them so that that person may be put to shame. You know, we should, we should, we should feel horrible that we're not obeying dad. And that's not ungodly. That's God drawing on us that you are bigger and better than this. Now, this is a hard saying because you know people in other churches that you know are living different lifestyles. And maybe for a season you can hang and try to interject, but they just keep rejecting the life that you're living. You know what? It's okay that you're not hanging out with them anymore. It doesn't mean you don't love them, it means you really do.